Hi, my name is Shane Grayson, and I'm from Winworth School in Los Angeles, California. I will be presenting our research paper, Baby Cry Classifications Using Deep Learning, on behalf of my group, which consists of myself and my co-author, Wilson Zhu, from Los Angeles, California. A problem faced by many new parents is lack of sleep and free time due to an inability to calm their baby in a timely fashion. This can not only exacerbate the fatigue felt by a mother who has just given birth, but also cause anxiety and depression in parents with particularly cry-heavy children and disrupt their circadian rhythm, which, makes, which can cause a strain in the relationship between parent and child. Imagine this, a couple puts their newborn to bed for the first, time, for the first night returning from the hospital. They start leaving the room to head to their own for the first time have a good sleep in days when a shrill cry erupts from behind them. Immediately, they rush to comfort their child. They burp the baby, feed the baby, and do anything else that may calm them. Eventually, they succeed in quieting them down. But this is just the beginning of a process that will be repeated multiple times per night for many years. This is the kind of fatigue that gives mothers depression and anxiety. The kind of fatigue that makes fathers feel that they are hurting their child when they are doing nothing wrong at all. To solve this problem, we propose testing several deep learning models, each combined with a convolutional neural network in hopes of finding a capable model with the ability to find the reason for which a baby is crying. With this, the previous scenario could be a thing of the past. Using the model to hear the baby's cry and receive feedback almost instantly with an accurate prediction of why they are crying will allow for quick calming processes and no more trial and error. There have been many past approaches trying to solve this problem. Listed are just a few. One of the more recent approaches has been to use Gaussian mixture models. These are probability density functions that represent the weighted sums of component densities of Gaussian. Through clustering at the center of latent Gaussians, this method can avoid overfitting amazingly. Unfortunately, the accuracy is sacrificed in this approach. Attempts have yielded an accuracy of 81.27%. The next method is just a combination of simple convolutional neural networks, or CNN for short. CNNs are used in many image-based recognition systems, although they are usually paired with another program. CNNs work by creating a feature map using a filter, which pulls out features from an image by assigning weights to each part of a filter and multiplying them by the input or part of the image the filter is currently scanning. While these are commonly used alongside another program, by itself, they can be simplistic leading to low accuracy and are prone to overfitting. Finally, capsule networks have also been used. Capsule networks are a group of neurons who make predictions. If multiple layers of these predictions agree, a higher and higher level of the capsule network is activated. In this case, the input is, is an image of a spectrogram of the audio file of a baby's cry and the output what is being predicted is a label with a reason for why the baby was crying. This approach faces a similar problem as the previous approach with multiple convolutional layer neural networks. A lack of another program can lead to simplicity and difficulty fully analyzing data used, resulting in lower accuracy than what is possible with a combination of programs. These approaches demonstrated to us that a complex model using multiple different programs was necessary to achieve better results, as well as showcased how a low overfitting could be more important, could be more beneficial than a higher preliminary accuracy, which was shown by our data as well. Our data came from GitHub and was acquired through the Donate a Cry application for iOS and Android. Volunteer participants would submit a short, multi-second recording of a child crying accompanied by their parents' assessment for why the baby was crying. When used, each sample was labeled by this reason, 
and put into five groups. Belly pain, discomfort, tired, hungry, and burping. This data set was comprised of a total of 457 audio samples, 360 of which were used to train our models, 40 for validation, and 57 were reserved for testing. Before being used by our models, each audio sample must be transformed twice. The first time from an audio file into a waveform. This is done so the models read and understand the data, as well as start to show potential patterns between different groups. Some examples of this are an average crest trough amplitude much larger exhibited by the group labeled discomfort, or very continuous and consistent pulse durations shown by the hunger group. In order to make this first generation, the amplitudes are measured and given values from negative 32,768 to positive 32,768. These values are then shrunk to fit between negative 1.2 and positive 1.2. The waveforms are then transformed to spectrograms for very similar reasons. The reason that this step is necessary is that a spectrogram has another factor, frequency, which adds complexity and depth. Now, amplitude is measured by brightness. The brighter the spectrogram, the larger the amplitude and vice versa. The first step of this transformation is padding each waveform. So there are 60,000 samples in each, then giving the values to the frequency from zero to 120 and measuring amplitude in brightness. This is all accomplished using the Fourier transform mathematical concept, which turns the data into a frequency domain. Our proposed solution is to test three different deep learning models, a support vector machine or SVM, a long-term memory model or LSTM, and finally, a two-layer neural network. These were chosen as all three specialize in some sort of feature recognition and prediction or classification. And our goal was to test which is the best at this specific task by comparing the accuracy of the three using the same data set and training specifications. Each of these networks are different and therefore will offer a different perspective, so to speak, a different way to view and interpret the data, producing different results. SVMs, for example, do best in high dimension spaces, which means there are many parameters when there is a clear distinction between classes and where the number of dimensions are greater than the samples. In this experiment, everything is in the SVM's favor. There are a great number of parameters, meaning the dimensionality is high, much higher than the amount of samples. Even the distinction between classes should be vast enough due to the use of convolutional layers, making the trends of each class much more obvious to each of the three models to identify. On the other hand, the potential benefit of using a sequential model, a sequential based model like an LSTM, is that LSTMs have memory and can store patterns. They are usually used to predict the next picture in a video, like weather forecasting. In this case, the LSTM is remembering the patterns throughout the image of the spectrogram in order to give it back a label of which class it belongs to. The two layer neural network would have its advantage in its simplicity. With a simpler neural network, back propagation can work more effectively. Reducing the chance of overfitting could be useful when our data size is so small. With all of this information, we predict that the SVM will perform best, as this is an almost ideal situation, whereas the, for it, whereas the LSTM will perform worse, worst, as it must adapt adapt and the data must be changed to fit how the, how the model can best be used. Presented here 
is the learning rate shown by the three models. For training, the Atom optimizer was used. Each model was trained over a series of 100 epochs with a batch size of 20. Once all the data is in the form of a spectrogram, they are run through our models. Above is the SVM model layout that was used. This model starts, as well as the other two, with a resizing and normalization. Then there are two convolutional layers. These layers create filters or sets of weights with a defined measurement of pixels. This filter moves through the image of the spectrogram, moving a certain amount of pixels each time called its stride, multiplying these weights by the input or patch of pixels the filter is currently on. The output of these layers are smaller than the input and pronounce the slightly visible trends to ensure that there is little mistake in identifying. All convolutional layers talked about in the three models use what is called the rectified linear unit function, or RELU for short. Deep learning models that use a gradient algorithm tend to get trapped at a local minimum. In order to avoid this, the RELU function is used, which speeds up the convergence learning of the model. Later in the model, there is a random Fourier feature. This layer uses the Gaussian radial basis function, distributing parameters maps out from the input layer's dimension to lower dimensions to create a randomized feature space based on the approximate shift invariant kernels. Using this function, it ensures that there is a solution to be found. Uh, there's a solution found to any classification problem by increasing the dimensionality of its hyperplane to a level where there is a solution. This model then ends with a dense layer. The next layout is of the two layer neural network model. This model is very similar to the last with two convolutional layers. Where it differs is toward the end with a sequence of two dense layers instead of one. A dense layer is a deeply connected neural network layer where there are a set of neurons and each neuron connects to each neuron of the previous layer. Dense layers are faster to optimize and simpler than other neural networks while not sacrificing performance, which is why they were chosen. Finally, is the layout for the third model, the LSTM model. Unlike the other two, this model does not contain two separate convolutional layers. Instead, it takes advantage of one LSTM convolutional layer. This lack of a second convolutional layer could hurt the model as it could lead to much more nuanced patterns to analyze when compared to the more obvious patterns that the other two models are analyzing because of a second layer. This LSTM splits the image of the spectrogram into parts a sequence of pictures mimicking a video. This is because the LSTM models specialize in predicting the next picture in a sequence. They are used in weather forecasting often to predict how the weather will change and move based off of previous patterns. This layer tries to replicate that scenario. The LSTM model also finishes with a dense layer. Here are the training and validation accuracies and loss shown by the three models. The LSTM reaches an amazing 100% accuracy during training, although this can be seen as overfitting, as when tested on the validation set, it only achieves an accuracy of 72.5%, the lowest of the three. Overfitting can also be seen by the loss graph, where it almost appears that the validation and testing loss for this model are opposites. A similar trend can be seen in the two-layer neural network, where the training accuracy reaches 99%, but the validation accuracy levels out at 75%. The loss graph also shows large amounts of overfitting, resembling a slightly delayed, slightly less extreme version of the previous loss graph. 
Finally, there is the SVM model with the lowest training model accuracy of just 82.5%. Contrary to this validation accuracy, contrary to this, the validation accuracy is the highest of all, reaching 77.5%, which can be attributed to much less overfitting. This statement is backed up by the loss graph where both the validation and training lines follow the same trend, although still showing slight, amount, slight amounts of overfitting. The final accuracies displayed by the three models on the testing sets are as shown, which agree with the predictions that were, that were made. The SVM performed best with 86% accuracy, and the two-layer neural network and LSTM model shared an accuracy of 81%. Although, because of less overfitting, the two-layer neural network performed better. The relative success of the SVM can be attributed to a few factors. The data size used is quite small, which would normally hinder deep learning models as they perform at a higher level the more data there is, which could have hurt the other two models' accuracy and led to overfitting by simply memorizing the images instead of memorizing the group, the group patterns. Though SVMs specifically thrive using small data sizes due to the previously talked about ability to always find a solution when classifying by changing the dimensionality to a level where there is a solution. Another cause for its success could be the number of non-trainable parameters. If the SVM with 117 and two-layer neural network with three both had the same number of parameters, we predict the two-layer neural network would have, performed, would have outperformed the SVM by a large amount. The, LSTM's, the LSTM model's poor performance can be attributed partially to the nature of its task. As previously stated, the usual purpose of an LSTM is to predict the next image in a sequence. The LSTM's convolutional layer tried to compensate for this, but even then, the LSTM is labeling the sequence not predicting how the cry would change or continue. Besides, a low data size, the overfitting of the LSTM two-layer neural networks can possibly be explained. As said before, a high number of non-trainable parameters is beneficial for a model. On the other hand, a high number of trainable parameters can be a detriment leading to overfitting, which can be seen by how the two-layer neural network has 1.6 million trainable parameters followed by the LSTM with 100,000, and finally the SVM with less than 80,000, showing how less can lead to less overfitting. Through all of this, it can be seen that the SVM is the best suited for the task of classifying a baby's cry. As seen by the accuracy, there is potential for this to be applied in real life, although there are improvements that must be done before this. Firstly, a larger data size should be used to enable each model to perform to the best of their capabilities. Another improvement would be with the amount of groups. In the real world, there are many reasons that could cause a baby to cry, and limiting the categories to five for the models to classify each cry would lead to time wastage and much lower accuracy if applied in real life. My name is Shane Grayson, and thank you for listening to my presentation, Baby Cry Classification Using Deep Learning. Are there any questions?